Dr. Chin is the Richard Perillo Family Professor of Healthcare Ethics and an Associate Director of the McLean Center. Uh, Dr. Chin is Professor of Medicine with extensive experience caring for vulnerable patients with chronic diseases and a national expert on healthcare disparities. He's an Associate Chief and Director of Research for the Section of General Internal Medicine uh, here in, in the Department of Medicine, uh, as well as the Director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translational Research. Uh, Dr. Chen le leads initiatives to improve disparities in healthcare on the national level with the Merck Foundation and with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Additionally, very importantly, Dr. Chin was one of 80 physicians nationwide elected last year to the prestigious National Academy of Medicine. Today, uh, Marshall will um, moderate the panel on health policy and community health, and will begin with his own talk, the title of which is Behind Me. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Marshall Chin. Well, thank you all for, for being here. This is the 415 session on Friday, and so you guys are the, 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 the loyalists and the, the hardcore here, so thanks so much for, for hanging out with us this last panel. And uh, the, the other three speakers, Ellen Fox and Stacey Lindau and Nuke Balani, they're all outstanding, engaging speakers, so we'll try to keep us lively for this appetizer before dinner. And so just a, just a couple questions. That, uh, how many people, this is the first McLean conference you've been to? Uh, the first McLean conference you've been to. And let me preface this by saying that uh, this is the 415 session, so you can't raise your hand. You've got to respond with noise in terms of clapping or saying yes, okay. So how many people is, is, is the first time at a McLean conference? Okay. Yeah. And, and how many people, this is uh, uh, more than the first time they've been at the McLean conference? Okay, great, yeah. And, and how many people are enjoying this conference? You can do a lot better than that. That, that, that we've had some great speakers, and it's incredibly important for Mark that you are enjoying this conference. So who here is having a good time at this conference? <laughs> okay, great. So uh, Ellen and St uh, Stacy and, and uh, Anup and I will try to raid that energy as we bring you home to the, the 5.30 dinner. Uh, okay. So I was telling Kay at the break uh, that this is in some ways a scary talk, but one that can have a happy ending. Uh, important disclosure, so the, the co-authors on the main paper I'm going to talk to you are from Google. And uh, three main goals here with this particular talk, uh, to define machine learning and why it is important, to identify ethical issues with machine learning, and to outline ways to ensure that there's fairness with these different machine learning approaches. I'm going to start with two case studies looking at identifying patients for care management, <laughs> both with goals of reducing length of stay and identifying high cost patients. I'll explain what is machine learning, spend most of the time talking about the health equity issues that can arise in machine learning, and end with recommendations. And so this is a paper that came out about a year ago in Annals of Internal Medicine. And it's one of my papers that has had the most media attention. You, you see up there that uh, the popular press, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Consumer Reports picked it up. Uh, the scientific journals like Nature picked it up. Um, IEEE, which is the, uh, the, the journal of like 400,000 engineers, uh, picked it up also. Uh, so a lot of interest in this particular article. And one of the things they all asked about was case two in the paper. Let me explain case two. So imagine there's this hospital, this hypothetical hospital, which we will just say anonymously has the initials randomly UC, uh, and comes from a city that has a 
a map that sort of looks like the one on the bottom there. <laughs> and uh, let's make believe that, that um, uh, the folks that were running the, the, the medical center thought uh, very justifiably that it's a good idea to get people out of the hospital sooner. I mean, it's good for the patient, because we all know the hospital is a dangerous place, so as soon as someone is healthy enough, it's really good for them to leave the hospital. It's also good for the hospital, because first, that you know, if you're being paid on a per admission basis, you save money that way. Then also it frees up a bed. And it's good for the hospital and it's good for the community if you can have a, you know, a empty bed filled with a patient that needs it. So there's a lot of good reasons to basically have efficient flow there. And so they thought that if you could identify the, the, the patients who were most likely to leave the hospital sooner, you could then give them additional case management resources to make sure that any, resist, any resisting barriers were eliminated so they truly did get out of the hospital sooner. And so they have a data analytics shop at this hospital and then they decided to okay yeah we're all good uh, so no problem <laughs> we're all good okay um, so anyway, that um, they have a data analytics shop, actually a very excellent data analytics shop, and they came up with a model using clinical data to predict who would be able to leave the hospital sooner. Uh, and they found though that like, if you add patient zip code they came from, you could actually improve the accuracy of the model. You did better in terms of identifying who would be those patients who would leave the hospital sooner and therefore would get additional case management resources by the plan. The problem was they found that the patients who were ready to leave the hospital sooner were basically from the more affluent, uh, wider zip codes. So basically, the people who were doing well that frankly didn't need the resources as much as the patients who had more social issues, other issues that truly require case management. And to their credit, uh, the folks running this operation uh, identifies this as, as a problem and caught this soon enough and said, well, we're not going to deploy um, this model. We're not going to deploy this case management system yet. And we're going to basically come up with a system to ensure that this does not happen. And in fact, we can better yet design systems that would more proactively advance health equity. So actually, the University of Chicago has become a leader in these different efforts. The second, the second case study is one that uh, you may have seen in the papers. You also got a lot of coverage the past two weeks. Uh, High-profile article in Science by researchers that were originally in, in uh, the Brigham Women's and, and Mass General at the time, I believe. And basically, what they studied was um, this company called Optum. It's a data analyst company. And uh, there's a lot of health centers and medical centers that hire companies like Optum to do data analytics. Sort of the same thing of trying to identify who are the patients that you might identify for care management. In this particular case, they use the outcome of costs. They want to predict who are the patients that are the higher cost patients. And then, like oftentimes then, health centers will then use those, that list of patients to, to, for their care management list of patients to devote more resources to. What they found was that um, when you use costs as the metric, if you were an African American patient, you had to be sicker than a white patient to be uh, identified. In other words, an African-American patient and a white patient who had identical costs, generally the African-American patient was sicker, had more comorbid conditions. If you sort of think that through, and it probably has to do with like, well, we're not spending as much money on African-American patients in terms of like either they're barriers to access or maybe this differential care once people enter the system. So a problem. And, and, and the, 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 this is like the tip of the iceberg. So Optum's analytics affect millions of patients. And it's probably not just Optum's analytics, all the other companies too. So literally, the estimate was like a couple hundred million people in the, in the country are affected by algorithms like this, which are biased. This. Um, so, contrary to popular opinion, this is not a picture of Tom Cruise doing a presentation at a Scientology convention. <clears throat> this is actually uh, from a movie called Minority Report, which, who has seen, seen Minority Report? Yeah, it's actually, I, I think it's actually a great movie that if you haven't seen, it's worth looking at. Um, the basic premise, and I won't spoil it, you see two thumbs up there on the, the movie review. The basic premise is that Tom Cruise is a police officer in the future, and there is this analytic system where they can actually predict who is going to commit a crime and predict it before they actually commit the crime. And then Tom Cruise's unit goes in there and basically prevents the crime from happening before it happens. 
But you see the ethical problem here in terms of crime has not been committed, but you're basically predicting who's going to have the crime. And um, when I say it's sort of a scary story, and this is what I meant, uh, Kay, that like, um, it turns out like uh, this is embedded in basically almost all important aspects of our life, whether we know it or not. Um, and so uh, this is book, Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. So she goes through things like um, how you qualify for a mortgage, um, the college application process, uh, things like um, how judges decide how long a criminal sentence should be, uh, which uh, persons uh, should be the subject of inquiry by um, Health and Human Services in terms of uh, uh, child uh, uh, neglect issues and all. Basically, all these different areas, there are these algorithms that are, that are biased and that have real implications for people's lives, including uh, probably everyone here. So it's sort of hardwired into the system at this point. Um, okay, step back. What is machine learning? Uh, who here has taken a computer programming course, like in high school or college or at some point? About half the people. So you probably remember in your course these if-then statements. If greater than 100, then do this. If less than 100, do that. So a lot of if-then statements. Um, machine learning takes it to another order of complexity. So basically, your mapping is learned by the system given only input examples represented through a set of features together with their desired outputs referred to as labels. Uh, the example I would use for this is something like, think about the electronic medical record and all the information in electronic medical record. These machine learning systems will like not look at one piece of information or these simple if thens but look at this whole body of information in electronic medical record, these so-called uh, features, and then find out what's correlated with, with the labels. So it's a different order of magnitude in terms of the amount of data that's required and the complexity. <coughs> And so I'm going to describe where the biases come from, from both model development, how you develop the model, and then how you deploy the model. This is the main figure we have in our paper, uh, and I'm going to go into each section in more detail. The left part is model development, the right is model deployment. The next slide is going to be the model deployment uh, development side. So this uh, particular slide, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to make it complete. That you, you can go to the article for like, all the different examples, but I'll give you a flavor of uh, the types within each category. So look at the left-hand side of the figure. There's, like, for example, minority bias, where, for example, if you just have a data set that doesn't have a lot of uh, minority patients, well, you know, you're not going to have an accurate model if you just don't have a lot of patients to develop it upon. You see in the middle, there's that missing data bias. So for example, if you have good insurance, um, you know, you, probably you're gonna get most of your care in one different place. If you don't have insurance, you have bad insurance, um, you're more likely to basically get care from multiple hospitals, multiple systems. So your data is gonna be spread out across different systems. So any type of mo uh, algorithm that's built upon data from one system won't be as accurate for you because you have relatively incomplete data compared to most of the people here who probably have all their data, most of the data in one healthcare system. The right-hand side label bias, an example of that would be that um, there's some evidence, for example, that uh, racial ethnic minorities for uh, many types of mental illness may have more somatic physical symptoms compared to white populations who, uh, like a lot of the DSM criteria are these like, behavioral, psychological terms. So if the underlying criteria by which um, someone's labeled with a condition is erroneous, well then again, um, lousy data in, lousy data out. Uh, the next slide will be the uh, model deployment one. This is the patient side. So for example, you see the, the bottom left there, agency bias would mean that, well, maybe if you are a poor person or a racial ethnic minority, you weren't part of the process by which these models were developed and deployed. Uh, informed mistrust would be, for example, if there's a legacy of distrust that the community has for the medical center, they may distrust any type of algorithm or a system that was built upon something where, again, they don't trust um, uh, the healthcare system or the developers. Um, something like um, privilege bias, um, maybe you develop a model that requires technology that is not affordable by um, uh, the community. So for example, maybe you um, are using uh, an intervention, an algorithm developed for um, smartphones as opposed to um, uh, texting phones. Uh, this last one, this is the clinician side. And so uh, a couple examples here. So automation bias would be, for example, if the clinicians blindly accept uh, what the algorithm does without questioning it. Uh, the flip side could be dismissal bias, where if clinicians know that the algorithm is lousy for some populations, they may automatically dismiss it. Um, and so there can be biases built in those ways. Uh, the full model. Okay, so here's the ethics part. So. Um, I've talked about the problem. 
um, what are, especially it's a distributive justice problem uh, in terms of uh, these inequities. Uh, and here are three potential approaches for a solution. Uh, equal patient outcomes, equal performance of the models, equal allocation. So equal patient outcomes, so the idea here is that the model would lead to equal outcomes among different patient populations, or better yet, equalize, meaning that if there was a disparity to begin with, you've narrowed that disparity. Um, the challenge with this, though, is that the assumption is that we know what to do to intervene and that it will be done. Um, I spend most of my time in uh, the day job uh, working on the intervention side. So we actually do know a lot about what works to reduce disparities. The problem is that these interventions are largely not being implemented, as well as the way we pay for care does not support and incentivize. For example, things that David talked about this morning or something uh, that um, Oh, like Selwyn talked about, uh, that address also in terms of health, just largely aren't paid for. Um, so short of outcomes, you might think about performance. And then think now back to your clinical epidemiology or epidemiology course that you may have taken. The idea here is that you can make a model that performs equally well across groups, so like a more and less advantaged group, for metrics such as accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value. So you remember those buzzwords from epidemiology, and let me make it concrete. So for example, um, it may differ which characteristic you would want to prioritize to optimize depending upon the issue. So for example, um, like at the University of Chicago, there's a group that uh, has created these algorithms to determine who is looking like oh, they're on the general medicine floor and looking like sick enough that we think there's a high likelihood they're gonna start going downhill and require ICU admission. And so the idea is, here is that you would probably want to have a, a sensitive model. In other, words, in other words, that if you're in that category of uh, potentially benefiting from ICU admission, that the, the algorithm would capture. You don't want to have another diagnosis, for example, of a poor patient, for example, or a race minority in that category. You want to have a high sensitivity. Uh, example of specificity where you would want to avoid, um, have a high specificity would be something like, um, say like picking um, which can, uh, moles um, you should do skin cancer biopsies for. You don't want to have a, a high false negative uh, rate because otherwise you'd have like a, a lot of um, unnecessary biopsies in your um, uh, disadvantaged population. Or positive predictive value, uh, example of that would be, I mentioned that thing about like um, the automation uh, the dismissal where like um, you don't want to have a lot of false positives because if, if you keep on having false positives, then the clinicians will just start ignoring them because they realize the algorithm's not good. Um, it's important enough that equal performance does not necessarily equal uh, equal outcomes because there's a lot that happens after the, like a clinician will be fed the information. So again, equal performance does not necessarily equal, equal outcomes. But again, so it's complementary to an approach that emphasizes equal outcomes. The third approach I'll discuss is equal allocation. So again, getting back to that University of Chicago example of like, um, remember the case two where they talked about like trying to allocate more case management resources to the people that you thought would leave the hospital sooner. So it's the issue of like who would get the case management resources. So basically you can pick cut points for who qualifies that would ensure that, well, for example, in this case, like, you know, if you're from, you know, a South Side African neighborhood, you have equal access to an allocation of that case management resource as if you were coming from um, like an affluent white uh, suburb. So you could do that. Um, but keep in mind too that this does not necessarily correlate with actual need. In other words, you could pick a, a, a criteria for who would get then like the care management resources, but again, it doesn't necessarily correlate with need. Um, so the example I'm gonna give you is like, um, so like coronary artery disease and cardiac procedures. So there's uh, some like, literature that, that, that indicates that if anything, like uh, white people get too many unnecessary um, 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 cardiac catheterizations. And so for example, if you were to create a system to equalize that and make sure that more African uh, uh, women who are uh, getting fewer of these catheterizations actually get the same uh, rate as, as, as uh, white patients, you could equalize that, but you actually may be giving them equal access to an unnecessary procedure. So I'll also say that you know, it, it's, it's not a clean in terms of what's the best way to do this. It has to be sort of thought through. Um, so it's no cookie cutter solution, but I would argue that like, if you start like, thinking about the example I went through, you can actually think about like, um, just rational ways to sort of think things through. And so in practice, if you have sort of a, a good team of people sort of thinking this through, you can probably come up with a reasonable uh, actual set of choices of solutions for coming up with a, both a reasonable algorithm, cut points, and ways to allocate. 
So I'm going to buzz through this so we have some time for question and answers. Um, recommendations. Basically, the, the, the major point is that at each step of the process from developing to deploying the algorithms, you can design ways that basically intentionally uh, ask, um, are we introducing an equity problem? Um, and like, basically, and already yet again, can we proactively advance health equity? So for example, I'm gonna highlight like the bolded parts here. Um, when you think about the goal of the algorithm, you should review with diverse stakeholders, including patients, and to ensure that the goal makes sense. So for example, I, I would argue that like, like um, when you have like optum picking like cost as the major metric as opposed to a health outcome, I would guess that like uh, patient groups would say this does not make any sense and would, would push for um, the more worthy goal of uh, patient outcomes and patient health outcomes as uh, a, a metric. Discussing the ethical concerns, deciding which groups are the vulnerable groups, making sure the data is not biased. Um, the training data or the data that the algorithm is developed upon, making sure there's adequate representation of the vulnerable groups within those data. Talking about the fairness goals that we have discussed. And then once you think about deploying the model, then just track it to see whether you're running the problems uh, with different metrics. So for example, you know, looking at, well, is there some type of disparity in who's actually receiving the, the resource, for example? Um, does the deployment data uh, that you're um, actually um, implementing the algorithm on, is it similar enough to train data that um, is a valid um, uh, uh, algorithm? Is the algorithm useful to clinicians? Um, and this actually recommend before we actually launch the algorithm, again, touching bases with all stakeholders. And again, once you actually deploy the model, systematically monitor it with these metrics over time. You need to think of a clinical trial to formally study whether it improves outcomes or not. And then, of course, then getting feedback periodically from clinicians and patients. So I'll end with this slide that um, there was a, 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 a editorial from a Stanford group that accompanied our, our paper. And I, I love this quote, which was maybe like in their last paragraph. The only solution is to apply to artificial intelligence algorithms the very thing they are designed to supersede human intelligence. So maybe that's one of the themes of today in terms of the importance of the human touch, human communication, the human person. So even with a high tech thing like machine learning, you gotta insert the human judgment in there uh, to make sure that there aren't these problems that arise and again, to decide them in the best possible way. So that's my talk, thank you very much. Um, we've got about a minute then for question and answers and so maybe people uh, would love to answer questions. So um, the question was, like, uh, I'm not framing this way, right? so this is comp the question is, like, this is complex. Um, using the University of Chicago example, how can you actually sort of address this in a way that addresses that complexity? So let me actually sort of finish the story, like what actually happened afterwards. So it's just a really good group, the data analytics group. They're both really good technically and they're really good people and, and really sort of um, values driven people. And so again, they were horrified when they found out what was happening. And so they ended up partnering with the university's diversity and equity committee and folks who tend to have an equity lens on things. And so there's like a lot of discussions and sort of debugging this process and thinking about um, what are the different steps in the process by which problems could occur, and then how can we hardwire into the system um, these sort of ch checklists or like checks on ourselves to make sure that at each stage, like the last set of slides, we specifically figure out like, or think about how can we make sure nothing bad's happening, and again, better yet, how can we be making good things? So I guess not a magic solution, um, but um, if you bring good people together and a diverse enough crew and people take the equity lens, then people can come up with reasonable solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so um, my name is Kevin, and I'm the third year uh, family medicine resident over at Northwestern. Um, so in my career in medicine, you know, I've seen, um, this question kind of gets at how important you think it is for physicians to have 
competency and continue to be at the table when it comes to the development of technologies such as machine learning and, and clinical use. Um, because, you know, as I've moved throughout my career, there's always that one, like one or two people who are like, able, who really feel super comfortable with like biostats or building applications that can do really great things for clinical care and patient care. Um, and then they graduate and like everyone's afraid to touch it. Or, you know, there's a problem with the EHR and, and, no one, and everyone's just like, I can't change that. I'll never be able to change that. I'll never be at the table for the discussion. Mm -hmm. Like, what thoughts do you have on that? And right. do you have advice right. for people on like thinking about actually getting that human touch yeah. to the technology? Yeah, I say in terms of like thinking about as, as individuals that, you know, you need to sort of focus as an individual things that you're most passionate about. Having said that, there are some things which are just so important. So I mean, the thing about machine learning, I gave those examples how it's not just medicine, but it's, it's justice system, it's, it's like college applications, it's mortgage uh, applications, et cetera, all different parts of our life. If we didn't have um, basically the average person, so the, the patient, the public, or in the case of like healthcare, clinicians, I mean, it's such a, it has such a big effect upon what we do, it's crucial that we're at the table. Uh, and so basically it's this issue of, of activation empowerment, which again is one of the themes of, of today. And so again, it doesn't necessarily need, you need to be the expert in machine learning. However, you know, your input in terms of how, for example, machine learning affects you or your common sense in terms of like, is there a value or ethical problem here? You know, it's really important to have clinicians and patients at the table. So this is a great question. Um, I'm actually gonna move on. To, um, eh, I will move on, so I'm sorry. Uh, in terms of like um, um, keeping us uh, uh, relatively on schedule. Um, our next speaker is Ellen Fox, who uh, well known to our community, um, uh, uh, fellow of, uh, and attending these meetings for many years, uh, for many years, uh, ran the Ethics Center at the VA, a uh, huge uh, leadership role. Currently has a couple hats, both uh, as uh, head of her own ethics consulting firm, as well as she heads the Ethics Center at Alterum Institute, so uh, very influential. And um, uh, Ellen's gonna speak about um, a new national study of ethics consultation U.S. hospitals, current practices and perspectives of ethics consultation practitioners. So, Ellen.